Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast, coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Aaron, how are you today? I'm doing good, doing good. We're uh, we're on a little bit of a roll, a uh, couple of shows with uh, with both of us. Uh, although you, ju- that's you just jinxed it. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> I think plus that's going to change. I think here in the next couple of weeks. So uh, yeah, you know, with all the events going on, um, so a couple of quick things, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, we mentioned it last week. Uh, mentioned again this week. Uh, we are, uh, you know partnership now with uh, with O'Reilly, O'Reilly Media, and all the O'Reilly conferences. So we're giving away a free pass to Velocity. Um, folks just need to sort of send us one of their cool projects, uh, send it to us on Twitter, send it to the show, you know, uh, show at thecloudcast.net, and uh, we'll pick uh, a best project and uh, give away a free pass to the Velocity conference. Uh, the other thing, if um, and we'll put it in the show notes, um, if folks want free O'Reilly eBooks. Uh, they are now uh, allowing us to give away some uh, some free uh, eBooks uh, in the sort of dev and web and and uh, web scale space and infrastructure as code and DevOps and stuff. So uh, we will put the, the thing in the show notes, the link in the show notes, and uh, folks can go uh, try and get a few minutes smarter than they uh, than they were before. So that's yeah, all, that's yeah, all. we've got a. A couple of really cool things coming there. Yeah, we've got we've got potentially some free ebooks. We've got uh, some discount codes for other books that aren't on there. We've got some other shows coming up. Um, we'll we'll put a bunch of links in the in the show this time around. So take a look, definitely. Yeah. So um, so today uh, today's guest today's topic is you know again we we sort of have are hitting on certain topics and then we're kind of expanding on them. So uh, today's guest uh, excited to have uh, one of my. Uh, colleagues, uh, somebody that I work with on a daily basis. We talked a little bit about how my, my job sort of intersects with the podcast now. So, uh, Clint Kitson, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Brian and Eric. And uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit is Clint's been doing some very, very cool work uh, around uh, a lot of things with with containers and microservices, but uh, some cool stuff that he's been doing sort of investigation and research around what it means, uh, you know, with containers and microservices and and more persistent kind of data. We always talk about, you know, sort of stateless apps, but he's been looking at kind of how to deal with persistence. So uh, we're going to, we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Um, so Clint, um, I know your background, but uh, for anybody who's listening, give us a little bit about your background and, and some of the focus areas that you've been working on these days. Sure. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I actually hail out of the, the Bay Area, so I'm sitting in a pivotal office right now. I tend to call this home uh, maybe a couple days a week. Uh, Background-wise, though, I, I came from really a dot-com boom where I worked for a, a service provider responsible for a lot of the operations and actually helping to, to build out the uh, the services that we ended up selling. Um, you know, past that, I, I worked for a casino for about five years, uh, where we were uh, kind of heavily kind of replatforming and you know moving it forward at the time as far as technology goes. So we got very heavily invested in, in EMC and Cisco and you know some of the larger players. Uh, so, Clint, any any good casino stories? <laughs> I, I have so many to tell, but I, I don't know if I have <laughs> no, enough time not appropriate for the, for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, but you know, any time after the podcast, I'd be willing to share some good ones with you. <laughs> Um, but following that, uh, I worked for EMC. So I've been here for about five years. Um, very happy with it. You know, I joined as a V-specialist under Chad's Army, where I was a uh, SE out there talking to customers, you know, working with them on their virtualization you know, path, and, and really staying up to date with, with that area. Uh, following that, I was the uh, integration director for the D-pad, uh, one, or one of the directors for the D-pad group, uh, where we're focusing on, on the kind of the intersection of you know, newer technology uh, with things that are protection-oriented. So now uh, a dev ag- advocate under Brian Ryan, and I've uh, been here for about nine months. So I have a you know, pretty broad reach as far as like technology goes, you know, not only covering you know, how products are built, but you know, consuming them as a customer. Uh, and you know, I guess most, most recently, my, my focus areas have really been, you know, I guess when you look at the, the languages during the past five years at EMC, I've actually had the opportunity to kind of pursue things that were interesting to me on the side. And you know, VMware was definitely one of those big things, but cloud automation development were those other things. So I'd say that my, my background is more on a, a coder basis, you know, not a, not a developer you know, from the get-go, but I've definitely been turning into one you know, being here in the Bay Area and, and the technologies I've most recently been focusing on. Um, 
you know, I would say the current current focus area for me, you know, specifically like Go as a as a programming language is something that I'm very passionate about. I think Brian knows from you know listening to our our Slack channel that I tend to be uh, pushing the envelope when it comes to topics and you know where Go is being used and, and all these ecosystems that are developing. Uh, you know, Docker is definitely another big one for me in terms of kind of the next you know stage of automation for things further up the stack. Uh, vagrant and and other things. So kind of a, a wide range of things, but most recently a, a lot focused on containers and automation and Go. So that's interesting because you know I, I think there's kind of two folks out in the audience. Um, the the first one is you know the folks that really enjoy the the super seasoned people that we talk to and people that have been doing this forever, and then there is certainly a um, another portion of the audience that is kind of they're either on this journey or they want to do the journey that you basically just did. Uh, there there is a lot of folks that we know that kind of came up in the infrastructure side of the house and have kind of more moving over to this infrastructure as code and DevOps, and and so I think that that's really cool and and kind of a key piece there is you know you don't have to have always been a developer or you don't always have to have been in this space um you know it's it's kind of a little bit of a, a lesson to everyone out there of uh you know if if you have that that passion and want to go you know change your career most of us you know won't be doing the same thing for uh, through our entire career so that's really cool no. yeah i mean the other, the other thing the other thing i'll say and <clears throat> you know what what we do uh with, with the EMC code team is a little bit unique um, in, in that, you know, guys like Clint get a, a decent amount of time to, to go work on some, you know, focus on some of these new things. Um, but I will say this, you know, because a lot of folks will go, well, you know, if you're not, if you're not selling something every day or building something every day or whatever, then, then, then you're not as, you know, involved. But I, I will say this for a lot of people that are wondering, you know, how do I build up a team that's going to, you know, get good at these things and, and they're, they're hard skills to find and so forth. The, the thing that's been really amazing to me with, with Clint and, and some of the other guys on our team is, um, you know, he'll, he'll tell you, I mean, it's been a lot, a lot of, a lot of hours and a lot of hard work and a lot of stretching new muscles to, to get into some of these spaces, you know, containers and go and stuff. But the, the learning curve that I see from these guys is so fast, uh, especially over the last few months. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that companies ought to be thinking about a lot is, you know, if you really want to be in this space and you, you know, potentially live in an area where you're not going to have abundance of talent, like if you're not in the Bay Area, you've got to give people some free time to go spend uh, working on this stuff and give them some flexibility to do some new projects and, and try out this stuff because it's, it's the only way they're going to do it. It's going to be a little painful at the beginning, but, but man, the learning curve takes off like crazy. Well, and so Clint, that's actually a, a kind of a good question. I'm going to throw back at you. You know, you do live in the Bay Area. And you probably attend a lot of these events and talks and all you get exposed to a lot of the stuff that's out there. And, and we hear a lot of times about, you know, folks kind of going, well, you know, there's the rest of the world and then there's the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> so yeah. give us your perspective. Um, you know, is it truly like that and it advantages, disadvantages of, of kind of getting into this ecosystem out there? Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, you know, I, I have the opportunity to, you know, be here. Of course, I attend a, a lot of different meetups. I mean, I, I go between, you know, things that are, you know, platform oriented, things that are language oriented. You know, so I go, I, I kind of go across the spectrum. You know, I hear some pretty consistent messages here, and you know, when I talk to partners or customers, you know, outside of the area, you know, it is definitely a little bit different, right? Uh, I compare what's going on right now, I think, to the virtualization revolution, if you want to call it that, you know, 10 years ago or so. And I think it's kind of broadly accepted that, you know, the, the world in general, you know, different countries, the United States in general, probably came up uh, and companies started adopting the new technology in, in a similar gait. Uh, whereas what I seem to be seeing today, at least from, you know, my kind of external view of going to meetups here and more of the internal view of talking to partners is that uh, there's definitely a, a different cadence to how people are picking up containers and, and how they're able to take advantage of it. And, and you know, maybe one of the, you know, ma major differences is that, you know, there, there was definitely a, a clean path to getting to container, uh, to virtualization uh, when it come to, comes to P2V and, right, there was, there was certain things that were done to make tools 
tooling around you know helping customers uh, get on that path. But when it comes to containers, right, it's not exactly you know go from virtualization to containers, right? It's more or less you have to you know, look at your application and you probably need to re-architect and do a lot of different things. So I think there's probably a, a good reason for it, but the men- momentum definitely seems to be growing you know outside of the Bay Area, but but it is you know more at the infancy stages compared to where we are. Yeah. Now, now something that's interesting there too, though, is okay if we kind of compare virtualization and kind of a journey and containers and a journey. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to serve workloads and we're trying to serve apps. Um, and you know, the biggest thing that I've kind of found too is it's more about you know containers is a different architecture, but it serves a different kind of applications. Typically, it is this kind of world of of twelve factor apps and, and microservices. So, you know, give everyone a little bit of background on on why that's different from, say, traditional apps, and, and especially in the context of, of storage and managing data in particular. That's kind of where we're going with the topic today. Sure. You know, when I, when I think about 12-factor apps, um, I think one of the easiest ways to kind of put it another way is just to say that it's a, it's a web app or it's a, it's a SaaS app. And when you look at the architecture under the covers, it means a lot of different things. I think you, you know, one of the most important things when you're building these things out is that you're very cleanly separating out an application from its underlying infrastructure. So there's you know, a clean level of abstraction that occurs from the application, which allows you to have ultimate ultimate portability. Uh, so the, the portability right, is something that then kind of contributes to the, the more dynamic nature of what these microservice architectures provide, where you can you know, have something that's not tied to an OS, right? something that can arrive and disappear, and something that, that works as a unit. And that unit is actually part of a, a bigger system of things. I, uh, I saw a tweet, uh, I think yesterday, day before, you know, where someone, and I guess this, this topic's been going around recently, uh, people have been saying, hey, you know, the microservice architectures really aren't anything new. Um, it's something that you know, Unix did initially. It's something when you look at very complicated systems, such as airplanes, right, the different pieces of airplanes are split into you know, highly functional small things that just interoperate together perfectly. And that's essentially what we're applying to our software architectures with these SaaS or, or 12-factor apps or microservices. So it's, it's definitely it's different. Um, you know, we're, some applications, or if you look at the traditional you know, typical application that sits on a VM, uh, I think you know, a few years ago we'd say it was special because it's a, a LAMP stack. right? It's something that had a web app and a DB tier, uh, but that's not something that really scaled out or in dynamically uh, per tier. And I think when you look at the kind of the, the holy grail uh, that vir- the virtualization path was taking you know, as of a few years ago was you know, building this awareness within the virtualization layer to you know, see you know, additional traffic and then have the application or the VMs react to that and scale out. So the, the traditional sense of you know, looking at this was really focused on virtualization layer to solve some of these problems. And the, the 12 factor app, the microservice uh, way of looking at these things with containers, uh, is focusing on the application itself, right, and building the awareness into the app, right, built uh, built upon these small, you know, individual highly functional services that all work together as part of a system. Yeah. And, you know, so, uh, you know, a while back, maybe a couple of months back, we were, you and I were talking about, like, you know, types of projects to work on and areas to focus on, and I, and I, and I sort of said, you know, hey, we, we keep hearing this discussion where, um, you know, 12 factor apps and more modern apps, you know, everyone sort of throws around the word stateless all the time. And, and I said, go, you know, you've, you've been digging in a lot with containers. You've been sort of looking at microservices, go dig into kind of what happens to data when you're, when you're starting to deal with these kind of things, you know, like data in and of itself tends to be sort of stateful and it, you know, it, it resides places, whether it resides in a thing that's called a storage unit or whether it's a, a database or whatever. Um, Give us, you know, before we kind of get into some of the project stuff you've been doing, like, give us some of the basics that you sort of have been learning about what that means. And we talk about stuff like persistence and, and data with containers and, you know, if possible, kind of, you know, give people a sense of where that differs if, if you came from a VMware world, for example. Yeah, you know, I think you got to take a, a step back a little bit as well to say, you know, the 
container you know, world or this microservice world that's built for web apps and SaaS apps, or that's that's really initially you know what what it's solving. And uh, when you look at those apps and you look at how they're interacted with, right? They typically are inter- interacted with by way of consumers, uh, mobile devices, you know, being probably one of the, the largest demands for these. Um, mm-hmm. And and when you when you think about that, right, you're you're really trying to get data as close to the consumer as possible, so that that's actually driving you know changes in underlying things. So beyond building you know microservice apps, right, there's actually data under the covers that also needs to be you know closer to consumers. So when you start breaking out these architectures and you start taking traditional apps to these the new apps, uh, you actually start looking at different database technology and you look at doing things in slightly different ways. Um, um, there, there's definitely uh, you know ways of of doing that with with traditional databases, but they they don't do it in in the ways that you would like them for that distributed nature. When I uh, when I start thinking about like the the comparison for for people out there, if you're uh, you know thinking about you know virtualization. Um, you know, VMware has definitely been a, a pioneer in the in the space of, of hypervisors and abstraction of, of physical things, right? They they basically created the notion of, of virtual disks, and you can kind of apply you know software to find storage to a virtual disk. Uh, they've also kind of thought about the or been using the idea of you know layered file systems, snapshotting, et cetera, similar to storage arrays, uh, but applied at a, a, a software level. And, uh, you know, I think when you, when you start to look at the container or the, the data within containers, you can kind of look at it one way to say, hey, if I'm going to, you know, take this traditional database or I'm going to take a, a new style database and I'm going to put this inside of a, a container, I really need it to have certain qualities to it. And, and by doing so, I also want to be able to take advantage of, of certain things as, as well. So when you, when you think about putting this stuff in, in containers, right, you want the containers themselves to be first-class citizens or the, the data in the containers to be a first-class citizen. So you, you probably want to be able to take advantage of you know, array-based services as an example where you can replicate things from coast to coast, where you can you know, snapshot the data that's in a container and provide all these array-level services. So when we, when we think about the... You know the the container aspect of you know what does it mean to be a persistent data in a container? It kind of means a, a new thing when it comes to the container engines. So I think that's that's when I when I look at like the data plus containers, there's there's a a big thing that's that's missing, and you know that big thing is is something that uh, you know ha- is open for definition right now, but it's you know what we would consider the the data management you know plus containers or a, a container data volume. Okay, so so before we kind of go there, let, let's talk about the basics. So I build a container today. I define a container today, whether it's you know. <laughs> It's uh, it's got a WordPress application in it, or something more complicated, or or even just a layer of something. How does it, you know, what 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 are the basics of where it gets its data from today, or how does it mount volumes or file systems, or let, let's sort of start there, and then we can kind of go into some of the stuff that you've been exploring and some of these possibilities. So today, if we take you know the most popular container engine uh, being being Docker, uh, if you look at you know how it stores da- uh, data, it, internally it has a, a graph driver, and that graph driver has different plugins or, or drivers underneath it, which work with different file system layering technologies. So as I build a container, I start with a base image or a scratch image. As I load in files and I load in changes to the container, it actually creates these layers on top of each other, which are all essentially writable snapshots. So what I end up with at the end of the day, once I build my application, is a container which has, you know, 8 to 10 to 20 different layers, uh, and those layers are all packaged up. And, and each layer maintains its own MD5 or its own hash, uh, which then get compared against a central repository so that I can actually minimize the data that gets transferred. So it's a internal layering technology as far as the file systems go, and then that packaged up is essentially what's sent off to, to registries or to uh, container catalogs, if you want to use that term, that people then consume from. Okay. And 
so let, let's let, let's take that a step further. So, what am I what what am I missing from there? So, if you're if you're thinking about this on a bigger scale, and 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 some people are are saying, um, you know, I'm going to do everything in containers, and and they're going to be sort of greenfield apps. Other folks talk about, you know, I've got to integrate even even a modern application with a with an, with an older application, like. What are the things that, that you feel like are missing or what are the things that maybe people haven't had a chance to spend enough time thinking about, but operationally are going to become a big deal for folks as they, as they use these new frameworks and new infrastructure in, in uh, more prominent ways? Well, if you're thinking about like a, uh, you know, applying a, a database, maybe that's like Postgres or MySQL or something that's more of your typical relational database or, or Mongo or, or something like that, one of the newer databases or NoSQL databases, if you're thinking about putting those in, inside of a container, uh, right, it's actually the, the data for the database you know, defaultly is going to live with the container application itself. So it's going to sit on top of this kind of layered file system technology. And, and typically, right, that's not quite how you want a important application or, or something that drives data to, to, to exist. Right? You, you probably want your important data on as little layers, uh, as, as, as close to the you know, spindles or as close to the backend storage as possible to minimize latency and, and other things. Uh, and the, that's that's sort, of, sort of like what people have said in the past about things like like NetApps on tap or, or Ceph or something where you can expose a type of file system or something, but it really is living on top of something else that is, it's a different sort of native system. And sometimes you have some, some issues in terms of how well you can optimize that. Sure. And, okay. and when you, when you look at layering technologies, right, the, uh, you can look at the benefits of them mm -hmm. and the benefit for Docker from my perspective is really the ease of deployment. The idea that you can minimize, you know, how much you have to send, you can just send the most recent changes when you ship it to a catalog or, or other things. So it, you know, minimizes friction, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have the same, you know, benefit when it came, comes to operations. Uh, so, so it, when you look at that and actually VMware does the same thing around link clones, or, or snapshots. You can always use those, you know, for your VMs, but you don't necessarily want to, though, right? It, it isn't something that you want to do long term. So it's it's kind of similar when it comes to containers. Okay. Okay. And let me ask you this: so <clears throat> when containers kind of first kicked off, um, was it a lot like OpenStack, where where a lot of the things were really more kind of ephemeral and and those web scaly kind of um, workloads and and as we're kind of as it's maturing, are we moving more towards persistent architectures and you know a la you know Cinder and OpenStack, right? That that eventually had to be broken out just because there was a you know a workload need. Um, do you see that kind of trend in the container community, and and do you think it's going to kind of change over time in some way? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I um, so. Docker container engines and the new way of doing things is um, uh, you know, it's very popular and has huge momentum. I think if I take a step back, like you know, one of the VMware's one of the reasons for their success it was probably a lot based around uh, the ecosystem that they built up. So the partners that came to board to to really you know help them you know push virtualization. So I think uh, storage was one of the ones that that brought a, a ton of dollars and a ton of eyeballs into the industry. You know for you know, containers and for container management. Uh, so far, as you said, the persistence has been, you know, the design pattern for containers has really prim primarily been around non-persistence, uh, which why you, when you go around the meetups and you go around the barrier and you, you know, listen to how people are using containers, they're typically driven towards the non-persistent use cases today. And I definitely think that that is starting to, to change. People are starting to look at it again and say, you know, well, well, how can we how can we take this a step further, and how can we start driving persistent use cases uh, into containers? And I, I think that you know part of that when you actually dig under the covers, one of the great things about the open source community is that you know this stuff isn't being done in private. Right, you can actually go to projects like Docker. Um, there, there's uh, Flocker. There's um, uh, Kubernetes. There's there's a handful of other ones that are looking at you know how do we 
embed this notion of persistency and data volumes you know, into a container management pl platform and into a container engine. Uh, so there's there's definitely some work going on to to figure out you know how to I don't want to say anti pattern right you know how to take containers down this anti pattern route of persistence uh, but really how do we expand the use case a bit uh, so that it is actually valid for for these additional use cases that it makes a ton of sense for yeah and it almost seems to me okay to to way step back from all of this and, and kind of put it in super simple terms. There, it almost seems like, okay, at the persistence layer, there, it, it, whether it's containers or really any other technology, it's basically two ways of looking at it. And, and one would be, you know, treated almost like effectively like a local disk or block storage. Um, and then the other one is to treat it like a, you know, a shared file system. Um, either way, though, it seems to me that, that there's some modifications that would have to be made to that underlying, either the, you know, the lightweight OS the containers are on or the container packages themselves. But it'd be interesting to see where this goes and what kind of models those are embraced. I've been doing some reading on that, you know, lately, and it's been really interesting to see all the potential ways um, to actually get to data persistence. What has been your experience so far? That's, uh, that's something that that, you know, as Brian asked me to, to dig into the uh, you know data plus containers. It's something I've been looking at, and you know, I was, I was mentioning the the great things about the open community. You know, one of the great things is you can go to to GitHub. You can look at these projects. You can look at the different uh, you know, feature requests, and you, know, you can read through all the commentary that people are having around features. So. Specifically for Docker, there's there's different threads talking about you know creating dballs, uh, which are essentially these Docker data volumes. Um, you, you can see people in there contributing you know their idea around what a uh, an interface or what a you know implementation of a dball would look like, such as you know what type of storage policies they'd want to see and and stuff like that. Uh, so there's there's ways to go go see that and you know. I would say most recently, I've been working within the uh, the code team on on that aspect, and I think that the one of the important things that we've recognized is you know containers themselves are typically being ran on virtualization platforms today. Um, they're either you know leveraging core storage that are that is you know a, a part of that virtualization platform so you know maybe a an extra drive that was attached to the the vm that it's on uh, or they're leveraging the storage that's part of the base you know root file system um, or they're using some type of a possibly a nas platform like an nfs mount uh, uh, as part of where the containers are stored and then lastly you know, which is probably less popular but people are using things like ceph or scale io or something like that to you know use a, a software defined or something you know storage that is software that kind of meets the same model, um, but there's there's opportunity for for all these players. Um, the you know container persistence today, if you if you think about you know how it's done, you for Docker as an example, you have this var lib Docker directory, and what you do is you you would either uh, actually one, one of the ways you do it is you would actually attach say an NFS mount to the var lib Docker directory, and then all of the containers themselves are then stored on this you know shared storage that you assigned. Um, but I think when you look at that process today, uh, it's typically a manual process, and it kind of goes back to a ops centric. You know, method of doing things. Uh, you know, anytime you start involving the infrastructure components like storage, you're you're probably asking the ops guys to provision it for you. Uh, you're probably kind of disjointed from this, you know, uh, infrastructure as code or uh, you know this new way of DevOps way of of doing things. So, you know, one of the the things that we're looking at is you know how can we have a container engine able to you know go in create his own containers on the fly or container data volumes, you know, carve those out of storage arrays or storage platforms or infrastructure platforms on the fly, and then how can we have those then assigned and attached to the proper containers so that they can use them as data volumes? So that's really a kind of an interesting area because if you can if you can accomplish this notion that you know Docker itself or the container agent itself is able to provision its own you know external storage um, and you're able to have that through these Docker APIs, 
then you can actually take that a step further and you have general what we call composability, which means that you know things outside of Docker, things outside of the container engine like Kubernetes uh, can have a more of a global awareness of your volumes and they can actually issue these commands directly to Docker to go do things and they can help kind of manipulate and you know orchestrate the usage of these uh, container volumes uh, at a more you know broad or scaled out sca- scale for the container OSs. Now, but, now, Clint, do you think about that as sort of, and this is probably going to be a bad analogy, but is that sort of like, uh, sort of like DHCP for finding, you know, my, my associated volumes in storage, or is it more of a, a broader, you know, kind of service discovery kind of thing, um, where storage just becomes, or, you know, data and persistence just becomes a service that, that the container should go sort of subscribe to and find? That's kind of interesting. I, I think that's a, it's a good analogy. Uh, we're start, still kind of chewing on that one, but you know, if I compare it, if I kind of just expose, you know, how it's done today, you know, if you think about DHCP, it's it's abstracting, you know, any of the networking details, and you know, you ask it for something, and it returns you an address. Doesn't matter where you are. DHCP is a standard; it should work basically no matter what. Uh, if you think about, you know, I guess where we're going with this container OS is that's an aspect that I was looking at, which is, you know, if I have a container OS that sits on top of, you know, anything, whether it's physical, virtualization, cloud, what have you, uh, if you want it to interact, you know, and provide storage, right, the, the container OS's abstraction layer is actually the, the Linux kernel. So the container OS is uh, receiving devices and NFS mount points uh, in, a, in the same fashion it does across no matter what the underlying storage provider is. So in a, as an example, in a, you know, a, a cloud environment for, for vSphere uh, or a hypervisor environment, you know, the container engine would, you know, do a, a form of uh, guest introspection, uh, which means that he would actually look below him and say, you know, what is my underlying hypervisor platform, and then he would uh, then have something which is able to talk, you know, at a control plane layer to that hypervisor and say, hey, you know, I need to create a container data volume. Uh, you know how to do that for me. He requested, you know, this storage profile. Go ahead and assign it to my VM. And and so there's a, you know, the the idea that a container OS and Docker, the the engine itself is able to to manage its own storage has a lot to do with the abstraction layer that's created by Linux, but then it has a lot to do also with the um, the guest introspection, right? This notion that he can you know go below him and see who he is and request right the right uh, the, or do a request in the right way. Yep. So. Because we're getting a little bit, we're getting a little bit in the weeds, and some of this stuff is sometimes, you know, hard to to kind of grasp if we're just talking about it. So let's let's do this real quick for folks because there's, um, and, and this has nothing to do with with EMC World next week. We always try and keep the show and, and our day jobs kind of separate, but the timing is a little bit similar. Um, to talk about just sort of the the names of the projects that you're working on and a real quick kind of. Uh, you know, one one of, of what some of those projects are doing and, and people can go take a look at them because they're all open source and they'll be available. We'll put the, the links to the show notes, but they'll be out on GitHub. Sure, absolutely. The So the, the this project around guest introspection or this idea that I can uh, kind of look below me, see who I am, and then make a, a request for storage agnostic of whether it's, you know, vSphere or you know, AWS or anything like that, that's a project called Rexray. And uh, that's going to be available. We're going to have a lot of video demos and, and content uh, that you can check out on, on GitHub. Uh, so that's actually a very, very cool one. Uh, there's another one called Dogged. Uh, so Dogged is our project which fo- focuses on the persistence of data with containers. Um, and, and the idea is there that you can have, say, the, the Docker engine or any container engine you know, request storage uh, from you know, his underlying host and then have that storage attached to uh, containers as they are fired up. And, you know, so not only am I managing storage at a container level, but I'm also then able to provide array-based services uh, such as replication, snapshotting, uh, QoS, etc., at a container level. So, you know, Dogged and Rextray are kind of two of the things that I've been working on, uh, which are, you know, interrelated, uh, which really form that, you know, data persistence with containers for EMC code. Okay. And, and all this stuff, um, you know, we, we've been doing this 
Um, obviously, at some point, there will be some things that, that EMC potentially can pick up and, and put into their commercial products or, or associate with products. That's not necessarily why we started all this. It really was we, – we, we, we had the thinking that, you know, as much as people may be uh, kind of religious about, you know, kind of the 12-factor thing, we, we've always seen historically that whether it's, uh, you know, whatever the new thing is, there's always a certain amount of, in reality, you've got to figure out how to build a bridge from where you were – to, to, to where you want to get to, at least for a, a, a mass part of the market, maybe not for the, the unicorns and the lighthouses, but, but for that. So this is really trying to do something in the open space, uh, hopefully being able to do this stuff with some of the broader communities. You're, you know, you're doing this so that it could be picked up by a Docker. It could be picked up by something else, um, maybe work with the Kubernetes project. Um, and again, all this is going to end up being out in the open. It's written in Go, so it'll natively fit in those languages. Um, but I it think, always comes down to that there's there's always more brownfield than greenfield out there. Yeah, yeah, and it's, you know, and, and uh, you know, the whether, greenfield's fun, but the brownfield makes money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, no, that, and that's very true. I mean, the you know, the typical enterprises out there, or uh, or others. I mean, the, sometimes it's it's tough to to see where technology is going, and you know, I've always found that the best way to do it is to to demonstrate, and you know, that's partly where say Dogged and Rex Ray are going to come into play, and and I think that you know, once a lot of the large storage players you know, realize or, or understand you know where they could fit within that ecosystem, um, you know, once they see that there's there's things being built out specifically to allow them to to hook into, and and frankly that they're able to to play a part in actually defining it, they're they're probably going to find it refreshing, and we're going to see a uh, you know a lot of the the brownfield are probably going to look at it twice and say. Hey, you know, maybe maybe there is a place for you know my data within containers that is persistent in the future. Yeah, yeah. So, well, listen. Um, I know. Uh, so we're we're sort of running out of time, Aaron. I know you you've got a commitment, so we may you may end up just uh, uh, magically dropping off. But uh, Clint, thank you very much for this. Um, so, real quick, uh, where you know, obviously, you and I are going to do some stuff at EMC World next week. We're we're doing some stuff with DevOps Day or DevOps Day on Sunday and and some other things, but. How can people, you know, uh, get in touch with you on Twitter? Where are you putting all your work and, and stuff like that? Sure. Uh, so Twitter, it's at uh, Clinton S. Kitson. Uh, I do, uh, I'm definitely on, on GitHub as well. So github.com slash uh, Clinton S. Kitson. I have uh, repositories on there. You know, I'm actively communi- uh, contributing to the EMC code site. So you'll find a decent amount of projects that I'm associated to there. Um, so feel free to, to reach out to me, you know, DM me on Twitter or, uh, you know, reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll hook up, but I'm, uh, always interested to hear, you know, any ideas and always interested for collaboration on any of these projects. Yeah. And we're, we're hoping that, you know, this, this sort of podcast and the stuff that we're putting out there will, will hopefully be a good public beginning for, for a bunch of these discussions with, you know, within the community and, and across the community. So, all right. Uh, you know, for that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up um, for Clint and for Aaron. Uh, folks, we're out of time. Uh, as always, you can follow us on Twitter at thecloudcast.net or reach us on the web at thecloudcast.net. Um, you know, you can find all the links to the show, all the social media stuff and things like that. And as well, just a reminder uh, for the stuff, if anybody's interested in, you know, the Velocity Conference or any of the free stuff that we're getting from O'Reilly, go check out the show notes. It'll all be there. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing about more of your cool projects. So for Clint and for Aaron, Uh, We will talk to you next week. Thank you.